Well, welcome to the second edition of Debt Talks, hosted by the Private Debt Initiative of the Institute for Neoeconomic Thinking. My name is Moritz Schulerich, and I'm a fellow of INET, and I'll be moderating the event. We have an all-star panel today. I'll introduce it in a second. Um, just very briefly, the idea of Debt Talks is to bring together different voices from different you know, walks of life and different disciplines to better understand the explosive rise of private debt in many economies and the economic, social, and political challenges that uh, this brings. Um, the panel today will focus on the question how debt and race are linked and how finance has contributed and still contributes to racial inequalities of income and wealth. The main question we have uh, for today and uh, that we'll discuss with the panel that I'll introduce in just a minute is to ask what role do debt and finance play in generating and perpetuating racial inequalities and also what should be done about it. We will have a quick introductory statement by each of the panelists and then move on to the discussion. There'll be possibility for Q&A, so please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to send in your questions and we'll weave them into the discussion uh, as we go along. So, but it's my great pleasure to introduce our uh, all-star panel. First, uh, we'll start with Marissa Baradaran. She is a law professor at UC Irvine, the author of uh, the, the, his, the Color of Money, History of Black Banks and the Wealth Gap in, uh, in America. Uh, we also have Louise Seamster. She's a professor of sociology and African-American studies at the University of Iowa uh, and is, uh, among many other things, has written a great paper on uh, black debt and uh, white debt in, in America and will help us. Ashley Harrington is the uh, federal advocacy director of the Center for Responsible Lending. She, uh, her work is focused on student debt and uh, but also other forms of um, uh, of, of debt in, in, the, in the economy, uh, and uh, we'll, we were very interested to hear more about uh, policy proposals and policy uh, questions um, going forward uh, from here at this critical juncture. Last but of course not least, Derek Hamilton is a professor of economics at the New School in New York where he just moved and uh, is an expert on the uh, question of uh, racial inequalities generally, but uh, more, and also especially the side of housing and the role of housing debt in the economy. Um, let me start with, um, we'll start with our quick introductory statements. And I wanna start with Marissa, um, who has written this fantastic book on, on the color of money and black banks that is really eye-opening with respect to the role of finance in shaping uh, wealth inequality over time. Marissa, in your view, what, is, what are the key links, uh, what role do debt and finance play in generating and perpetuating racial inequalities in the US? Um, thank you so much. Thank you for doing this. And thank you for having me. Uh, you know, I, I think, uh, Jim Crow, the police state of Jim Crow was uh, replaced uh, s sort of smoothly and uh, irrevocably with a sort of Jim Crow credit system. And, and the way that I think debt works to perpetuate uh, racial subordination and domination, both domestically and abroad, which I, but I will focus domestically. Um, domestically, the, the post New Deal era American landscape was shaped by credit. And there were vastly different credit systems within the sort of white suburban um, FHA guaranteed GI Bill given uh, wealth uh, sort of you know grants and within in the red line um, black areas where not only was there not subsidized credit but there was a very coercive um, installment credit uh, contract credit debt debt be became the way that you maintain those segregation patterns, even post civil era, where you couldn't actually explicitly, uh, you know, put in the law uh, uh, racial uh, segregation. You could do it through uh, FICO scores, and you could do it through um, uh, the way that ge geography, the debt, and credit is embedded in in geography. Now, um, through homes, through types of um, you know lenders that are available in your neighborhood. So, so I think you know uh, when I started focusing on this, I came from it from a banking side, uh, and it, I, I think there there is a, a huge field here um, for for more exploration. And, and the panel here demonstrates there's a lot of um, ways in which debt um, uh, is is very it, it, it's an invisible 
system of uh, racial disparity. And and some, and it's, it's it becomes visible when you look at the statistics, but the, the ways that the subordination works is, um, uh, you know, it has just as much violence and, um, uh, har, har, you know, uh, and, and, and the, the previous, but um, it is run very differently. So I, I uh, to have more of a conversation about what we all see as, as some of the, the commonalities and, and differences. I'll stop there. I think you said five, less than five minutes. I'll try to keep it short. No, thank you so much. Um, let me move on to, um, we'll, have, we'll come back, we'll have time to uh, we talk about some um, examples where this sort of violence is in the credit system, and we'll come back to this in the discussion. Let me pass on the, the microphone to, to Louis Seamster. I mentioned Professor of Sociology and African-American Studies at the University of Iowa. Louis, uh, you, you've worked uh, a lot on the difference between white debt and black debt. What's the difference between white debt and black debt? Sure, thank you. Um, and I'm letting you know I have a bad connection, so um, if I become electronic, just skip me and I will call in. Um, uh, so I've been thinking about, um, it, along similar lines to Marissa's work and thinking about a, a Jim Crow credit system, thinking about how when we talk about debt, we kind of assume that we're talking about one thing, um, but that it's important to think about this is as a parallel debt system um, in many domains. Um, and I am uh, the piece that I wrote called Black Debt, White Debt was an intentional um, building on um, the classic book, Black Wealth, White Wealth, but to think about how um, debt can be an advantage for some and a hindrance for others. And, and, it's, and it could be the same, um, it could be the, the, types of products you have available. It could be the different terms for the same products, or it could be different outcomes, even if you hold the same debt. So I'm sure we'll talk more about this later, but um, student debt means really different things for a black household than it does for the white, for a white household, even if it's a smaller amount of debt. Um, and so I, I've been trying to conceptualize um, how one conceptual uh, uh, thing like debt can can play these different roles. And I, lately I'm thinking about it as kind of a, like a chemical reaction where different amounts of one thing can cause widely disparate effects depending on, on the who you're using it on or how much you use of the substance. And, um, and thinking about how um, white wealth was actually built and leveraged through debt is really a key to understanding this and understanding not only how Black folks have been shut out from that white debt system for decades and how there's all kinds of new mechanisms for doing that, but also how the there are um, always um, parallel worse debt products that are then available to, to Black families. And how increasingly what we're seeing in the financial system is um, banks learning how to cash in on those formerly more off the books forms of debt and provide um, a wide range of products to tailor to each person's um, debt situation. And I'm thinking a lot about how um, white debt is um, kind of bringing you into the overarching system of a racial hierarchy, um, whether or not you want to do so. So thinking about what it means to hold a mortgage and then be invested in your property values going up, what that might mean as far as your advocacy in terms of rezoning your school district or um, how you interact with your neighbors so that you know the there's these abstract debt worlds there's how it plays into your concrete mortgage and then there's also how it trickles out into all these different aspects of your life that um, I find very um, concerning but intriguing to try and like really sum up what what debt is doing to us and how it's kind of disciplining us all whether it's um, in a, a penalizing way for negative debt um, forms or causing you to cause harm to others for the forms of debt that advantage you. And that's good to start with. Thank you very much. Um, Derek, you is, is one of the leading voices clearly in the, in the public debate about uh, racial inequalities of income and wealth. Derek, in, in, in your view, what is, how is it that 
finance contributes to uh, ongoing racial inequalities of income and wealth? Is there a specific role for finance or housing finance, especially, that you could point your finger to? Well, lack of finance leaves people with little options but to attain abusive financial products. So, you know, we talk about the racial wealth gap, but the framing, including the use of alternative financial service pro products, focuses on poor choices and decision making on the part of largely Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and poor borrowers. That framing is based on a cultural poverty thesis where Blacks are presumed to have a low desire and acquisition for education. The problem is that framing is wrong, the directional emphasis is wrong. It is more likely that meager finances leads to poor choices than poor choices leading to meager finances. I mean, authentic agency is grounded in resources. And in America, we have a long history of a racial wealth gap in which whites have been privileged by, with financial advantages to buy crucial additional advantages for themselves and their children. I mean, it was literally government giveaways that, that facilitated a white asset-based middle class. Um, and when Blacks were able to accumulate wealth, it was subject to political confiscation or, or theft or terror. Financial behavior and literacy, they're irrelevant if you have no finances to manage in the first place. We know that once you control for income, if anything, Blacks have a higher savings rate than white individuals. Uh, but also when we think about debt, what we consider good and bad debt has different meanings when we consider race and the fact that the rate of return to a home for a black person, the rate of return to a college degree for a black person is less than that of a white person. And they're also politically as well as financially vulnerable to predation. So, you know, if we think about millennials, we know that generationally millennials have taken out record levels of debt. They have record levels of, of um, not being homeowners compared to every generation dating all the way back to 100 years ago to the greatest generation. They, they as a group, have lower home ownership rates of than similarly aged generations dating as far back as the greatest generation. And what's more, the racial disparity in home ownership for that group is as large as it's ever been since we've been recording uh, home ownership by race. You know, at the end of the day, I am an advocate for full cancellation of student debt. Uh, not that it's necessarily going to close the racial wealth gap, but it is the just policy to do, especially when we consider that uh, Black people, Black students, four years after graduation, on average, have about $53,000 in debt. And also that um, black people, because of labor market discrimination, very well may be pursuing resume building strategies of going to college so as to avoid being um, destitute in, in the labor market. So, so in the end, um, I think the things I'd say is that when, when we see predatory uses, when we see uses of predatory products, it's not a choice def or, or deficit in attitudes or behavior. It's the result of lack, lack of resources to begin with. And that if we want to think about addressing the racial wealth gap, ultimately it is rooted in which you started out your question in, which is finances to begin with. Thank you so much, Derek. Uh, we'll come back to a lot of these points in the in the discussion in just a minute. But I want to uh, come come to uh, Ashley Ashley Harrington, um, Federal Director of Advocacy at the Center for Responsible Lending. Ashley, from maybe from a from your work on on advocacy, where do you see the most uh, sort of the, the politically uh, most important areas of of action right now? Absolutely, thank you, um, and thanks so much for having me. I think I'm really glad to be here and talk about the policy perspective because I think um, what all of the other panelists were getting at is that a lot of this was policy choices. These are policy decisions that have created winners and losers. Too often, Black people and other people of color have been, uh, these policy choices have decided that they will become, be losers and remain losers because we've created a system that continues to bifurcate this, uh, bifurcate financial opportunities and options. Um, it's a choice when we decide to deregulate for-profit colleges that we know target 
of black students and other students of color and charge them more and provide subpar degrees, right? It's a choice when we see admin the administration rolling back rules like the disparate impact rule and the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule, which were aimed at um, uh, addressing some of these lending discrimination issues. It's a choice when we watch the Office of the Comptroller and the, of the Currency revamp the Community Reinvestment Act, which was a direct response to the federal government's history of redlining in a way that actually doesn't help the communities that are still struggling um, continue to be able to advance. So all of these are policy choices. And what we're seeing right now, particularly in the time of addressing um, the COVID public health crisis and the economic recession it's causing, and remembering that communities of color still haven't recovered from the Great Recession, right? We lost over a trillion dollars of wealth just communities of, from communities of color. And that's not just people who lost their houses, but the spillover effect of what that what the foreclosing of houses meant for entire communities. So all of these and the response to that, um, the recovery that happened after that also skipped over these communities that were hardest hit. And now we're watching the COVID crisis hit those very same communities. Um, and so we're, we're seeing that there is a response to this. Um, we just we just saw Congress move in the past couple of months in ways that we've never seen them move that fast, that quickly, passing trillion dollar relief packages, billions of dollars going to small businesses. Um, but, but that small business program actually being uh, directed through financial institutions. And when you think about the fact that, as everyone's mentioned, Black people and poor people have not had the same access to, to traditional financial institutions. And then the biggest relief program that we've ever seen for small businesses went through financial institutions. Shows us that, um, again, we're privileging some groups more than others. And again, these are policy choices. How to get funds to people are policy choices. The fact that the student debt crisis has become so huge that we've actually seen some form of student debt relief in the packages in response to COVID. We've seen student debt cancellation become a part of major party platforms because we are over 1.5 trillion, 44 million people. But again, the crisis is worse for black borrowers who have to borrow more, who struggle in repayment and are more likely to borrow. And again, what the response is that we haven't seen the Pell Grant keep up with the cost of college, that state budget cuts have meant that there's a major hole in how we're funding higher education. And that is passed on to people of color, passed on to students who are going to school. But those students, if you're if you're if you're people of color, if you're a black family or a white black family or a Latino family, you have less familial wealth to draw on, less home equity, less other assets to draw on. So you have to take out more debt. And then and then it becomes intergenerational as parents are taking out debt to pay for their kids to go to school and they're still paying off their own. But the terms of the debt have had, which are set again by statute and regulation, how how you can pay it off, how that how student debt interacts with mortgages and the debt to income ratio and how they look at your student debt. All of these things are policy choices and decisions that are being made every single day that have a disproportionate impact on people of color. Thank you, Ashley. Um, before maybe we have the opportunity for you to, to react to each other, let me, uh, I, I think I, I see a theme, which is um, there is clearly discrimination. Mercer mentioned the geography of financial products that uh, prevent social and economic advancement. But there's, so there's an idea of too little access to, to the right kind of finance. But there's also a very strong idea in, in what Ashley and Derek not least said. There is too much of the wrong kind of finance, just predatory lending. There are kind of forms of debt that um, are um, actually doing the opposite of, of, the, of the advancement we have in mind. How do we get more of the good and less of the bad? What are the steps that we should look at for the next, call it next decade? To everyone, by the way, um, feel free to um, jump in. I mean, I'll say there's a third option also, which is just straight up grants and straight up economic rights. Why, why should we burden people with good or bad debt to go to college? We have enough resources in society to take care of that. I, I would I, I, concur. I, I, <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, okay, it's okay. I, go ahead. Um, I would concur. I um, really like a recent paper by Abby Atkinson called Rethinking Credit as Social Provision, where she says any form of debt for a low-income family whose, whose income and finances are not 
improving is going to be a net harm because they're paying any amount of interest and saying that debt is standing in for decades worth of cuts in social policies, including education. But we could look at also public housing and, um, you know, the amount of debt people go into to cover health care expenses is direct out outcropping of our health policy. So um, I, I would uh, agree with Derek that um, I would go in a different direction because the reason why we have debt that is good is because we have debt that is bad, that um, you can't just give everybody the good debt necessarily. This debt system is designed to work for some people and not for others. And so if you, I um, hypothesize that if you let in, other, you know, people who've been formerly excluded into into the good debt forms that they would become stigmatized or um, harmful in another way, which is why I've been writing about predatory inclusion um, with Raf Charon Chenier in student debt, um, that, that things that were good can become bad. This is all a moving target. And, and, and would you say, Luis, regulation? Yeah, sorry. No, Marissa, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Yeah, was Luis going to say something? I, um, I my, my comment. Good on, yeah was this is a hard format <laughs> um my uh my comment was, was to you know I, i'm ambivalent when you ask you know what how do we make debt better because i i think debt is a little bit like you know um water or some other thing where it, it can be good or bad depending on how where it flows and how much and what we're using it for you know and and i think um uh Insofar as we have the system that we do have, which is, uh, you know, a capitalist system where uh, money is sort of, you know, a top-down, state-run institution that is run on debt. Everything is debt. Money is debt um, at the top and especially at the bottom because it's more uh, tangible. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I'm ambivalent about whether we use debt or some other a form for people to get the things that they need. Um, but I think that's, that's sort of the goal is how, how do we in an egalitarian way, um, provide meaning and shelter people to do that by themselves and not have the state sort of coercively push people in, into a system of domination or, um, you know, indebtedness, you know, using debt for, for those things versus using, you for um, a society, and and so I, you know, I think by, I, I, um, um, the debt credit money system to, to, is, that we have is what we have, and um, to say that we sh we we should not have debt uh, would mean um, recreating that sort of central infrastructure of money, which I think we should we could and should do. Um, but, I, but I don't think we should do it for just some people, because I think that's the same sort of, um, exclusion that comes, you know, I, I, uh, think if we're going to not have debt, then we should also not let the fed, you know, um, do quantitative easing for the banks because they run on sort of debt created by uh, the federal reserve. It's just very low interest debt that barely ever gets repaid. And so I, I, I think just looking at these things holistically, what, what, I think maybe keeping, you know, that, that in mind, where looking at, at, you know, how the debt flows and do we want to stop the flow at a certain level or do we want to just recreate um, that system? M maybe that's too abstract, but um, I, I'm ambivalent about debt only because it's not, it, it just is, is, is the kind of water uh, that we're using right now. So I think it's all of those things, right? We have to curb the predatory lending. We have to create more access to affordable, responsible credit for people who have traditionally been shut out from those opportunities. And we have to recognize that a lot of the credit and support that has been provided for centuries and decades to predominantly white people has been government, direct government assistance. And we do have to provide direct government assistance. Yes, grants for small businesses, for down payment assistance, for folks to go to college in the way that we have. We have to not be okay as a society with saying it was okay for the government to provide direct support and assistance to white people. That is not okay to provide now. It's not okay that the government created the white middle class and is literally inhibiting 
the black middle class from from forming and becoming stable. Um, so I think thinking uh, with student debt is a perfect example, right? So having debt free college, having a Pell Grant that actually covers the cost of college, equitable funding for our historically black colleges and universities and MSIs, all of those pieces contribute to the student debt crisis and how it's disproportionate impact on black students in particular. But that's just one piece. Um, Canceling some of the debt is also part of it. Down payment assistance, direct grants to businesses, all that has to be a part of it. But we also advocate at CRL for how we curb predatory lending, enacting a federal rate cap so that lenders can't charge triple digit interest rates, um, fixing our broken housing finance system so that they're, um, so that uh, Black people aren't uh, forced to take out FHA loans and, and not being served by the traditional conventional loan market when FHA loans are pricier over the life of the loan. And they've, um, you know, um, regulating the for-profit colleges, as I mentioned, um, regulating the debt collection industry that often siphons even more money out of communities, oftentimes when people don't even no longer owe that debt. There are a number of pieces of the financial system that need to be fixed, um, but it also is, so it's fixing those, creating more access, and having the federal government take a direct role in in equalizing the system that it created. You've mentioned, a few of you have mentioned the, um, the link between debt and income in the sense that debt has been a sort of a substitute for, for parts of the population for income growth and, and, and also a lack of public and social services. So I mean, we've in an interesting question that came in from the Q&A right now is, how do you see the role of sort of, um, you know, Andrew Young style um, income uh, guarantees, guaranteed income payments in, in, that, um, in, that, in that world where debt has taken over, partly at least as a, a substitute for income growth and, and, and public services. I'll, I'll go Anyone? unless someone else wants to go. Uh, you know, I, I guess um, I'm in favor of guaranteed income, but not universal basic income. Universal basic income dilutes the direct payment. Uh, <laughs> That, you know, we, we need to recognize that there are some that have more than others. And if it's universal, it's almost definitionally inflationary. And it also might lead to greater inequality because those with more will be able to use that additional resource to invest, whereas by definition, those with less will, will be subsistence and uh, have to consume it. But it, it, it leads to what I think is a bigger point, which is in this conversation, what I think we need to be thinking about is agency. Agency as opposed to a sharecropping type system where people have no alternative but to take debt and debt at whatever terms is offered to them. What we really want in, in our society is that for certain goods and services that are enabling goods and services that are critical for people to have um, upward mobility, to have agency in their lives and to have dignity, such as a home, such as the ability to eat, such as the ability to work, um, such as the ability to live, you you should or go to school and learn. Uh, there, there should be, in my view, viable public alternatives or some economic rights. And guaranteed income would fit under the domain of economic rights. I mean, we can go back to history with sharecropping, where Blacks were forced to take out um, debt that was basically an iteration of slavery in order to just be able to eat and, and live and work. So, you know, we want to avoid modern day systems like that. And I, I think there's a role of government to ensure that we have adequacy in things like education, uh, public homes, uh, as well as income. So basic income, not guaranteed, guaranteed basic income, not the universal part, fits within that domain, as would a federal job guarantee. Yeah, I also, I mean, I think, again, with, uh, with, with the questions, um, it depends on who's, you know, I've heard universal basic income discussed by 
um, both the right and the left. And and it really, I mean, the devil's in the details on that one. I mean, I think when you, when you have like Charles Murray and, you know, these right-wing libertarian think tanks, and, you know, it's also a Nixon idea that um, the idea is instead of social services, people will just get UBI and that will be like a... a Sure, almost. Um, and then you hear, you know, uh, the utopia for realists, you know, Conte Andrew Yang sometimes talks about like, this is a way for people to be able to pursue interests, you know, and avoid, in the words of the late David Graeber, you know, bullshit jobs and, and things like that. So I, I think it depends on, you know, what kind of income and how, how is the, the program managed and what sort of like Derek said, um, dignity in work, are people still able to do? I wouldn't want it to be a system of, okay, well, you know, um, the robots are going to take over the meaningful work and we're just going to pay people so that they can, you know, eat and breathe and not revolt, <laughs> you know? Um, so I, you know, I, I think, um, you, you, it, that it, it, the motivation and details do matter on this. Great. I have another super interesting question here. Let me just channel it um, from the from the audience. Um, I'll, I'll read it. I'll, I'll quote it. So in order not to um, forget any part. So crisis handling and crisis management seems to have, says uh, from Jack here, um, from our Q&A, seems to have particularly discriminated against racial minority groups, including um, monetary policy. How do we, do you agree with this and how do we avoid this? I could, I could give an answer for a somewhat different type of emergency situation based on my um, mm -hmm. research in Michigan and emergency management, which is actually not FEMA style emergency management, but fiscal style, uh, a mm -hmm. fiscal and then governmental takeover of cities in the state of Michigan based on their um, um, fiscal crisis as determined by the state. And this was a policy... Um, that was implemented in the last 10 years against half of the black population of the state, meaning that they had no local um, government, locally elected governance for at least a period of a couple of years. And um, I've been trying to wrap my head around the impact of this policy and what it kind of represents in terms of the larger dynamics that not necessarily um, it's a difference in size, but not in kind from the regular state politics um, relative to the majority black cities in, in the state. And, um, but you can see how um, when I when I went to Benton Harbor in Michigan, people were like referencing Naomi Klein's shock doctrine by name, saying this is what's happening to us. They're coming in right. and they are, you know, turning out the lights in City Hall and then <laughs> mixing everything up, moving our money out of the way, selling off our assets, and then turning the lights back on and saying, "Here you go, have it back." And um, and I think that. Um, and, and what people were also saying at that time was we are the test tube baby for everybody else. Um, and I think that is, you know, we saw a lot of these processes accelerated in this past year where um, things that people might have think thought were extreme as far as like asset stripping or like who would who would be left standing um, when we hollowed out everything else. Um, that, that it's really clear that it's not going to, you know, basic sustenance and sustainability. It's not oriented towards um, sustaining people um, across the land, but it's really uh, becoming a pretty brutal vision of, of who, who makes it. And, and I think, um, yeah, I think there's similar um, phenomena with, with like, so-called natural disasters as well in terms of where where we we're mobilizing resources towards communities and where the communities that are having resources taken away from them in the name of this um you know supposed fiscal crisis and and who's actually been causing the crisis for for decades and i think um if i understand the question i think also part of it is being, you have to be very intentional with how you both form the policies and also how you implement them. Um, I spoke about the Paycheck Protection Program earlier, which was this huge $600 billion program out of um, that was passed in response to um, uh, the current COVID crisis um, that was based on um, 
doling out funds to small businesses, but doing it through financial institutions as intermediaries. Um, more than just the fact that it relied on financial institutions, which inherently has issues for people of color who have had not had access to those financial institutions previously, the program was rolled out quickly. There were a no number of other impediments from criminal justice restrictions to um, when non-employer, sole proprietor businesses could apply, even though the vast majority of small businesses in this country are non-employer businesses. And it's an even higher rate for businesses owned by people of color. And yet they couldn't apply during the first week of this program, where we know, even as stated by Treasury and SBA, who were implementing the program, this, the speed was the name of the game. So in, a, in an effort to quickly get out funding through financial institutions, many businesses of color were left out in a, at a time when a week or two weeks could mean the difference between a business making it through that particular or failing, which is why we've seen a rapid decline from February to April. 41% of the decline in active Black businesses was 41%, 32% for Latino businesses, even though there was a $660 billion program aimed at helping small businesses. But because of the way the program was rolled out and implemented in a way that wasn't intentional and, di and had direct mechanisms ensuring that all businesses, particularly businesses of color, had access to this vital funding, we have seen that play out in real time in these businesses and what and then what happens in these communities. So I think it's a, it's a being intentional and not letting speed and efficiency be the opposite of, equ of, of equity, right? You can do both. You can do something efficiently and also do it equitably if that is your goal and if you are intentional about doing it that way. Well, thank you. Amazing. Um, let me maybe I want to bring Derek in. He's worked on the housing market a lot. And um, if you and I've, I've worked on this as well academically. So if you look at the uh, sort of wealth growth of, of, of white American households, uh, debt financed home ownership has played a big role in the past for the past two generations. Um, do you think and first to Derek, but obviously to all of you, uh, do you think that's a model debt financed home ownership where capital gains build up wealth over time? That's a model that is um, should can be followed, should be followed as well. If we think about um, closing the, the the racial wealth gap and increasing home ownership, or are you do you see do you see you know you have it, do you, do you see that there is maybe limits to um, how much debt can can do to address uh, racial inequalities uh, of that kind? So I think housing finance and the injustices, the ongoing injustices in that market, are of particular interest to uh, many people out there. What do you What do you think? What do we do? I believe you're muted, Derek. Sorry, I gave the profound answer while I was muted, so you all missed it. Sorry, no I'm joking. Um, no, thank you for that question. Uh, I missed some audio earlier, so I apologize if I say some stuff that's incoherent. Um, so, someone said this earlier on the panel, which is the concept of wealth is intergenerational. So, even thinking about whites as a model, it's not as if they're starting from scratch. So they're, they're financing debt with some resources to begin with. So they have you, you could have a substantial down payment. So even now, when we think about interventions to address home ownership, if we're thinking about, say, tax credits or tax abatements, um, if you don't have the down payment initially to benefit from some of the tax credits or tax abatements that might go along with it, you could be hastening gentrification because you have neighborhoods with low resource communities because, again, the iteration of intergenerational policy as, as, as well as uh, political vulnerability have resource one community at the other, and you're only ex expanding and facilitating that, that inequality. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, and then I'm going to say something for which my colleagues may get mad at me for saying <laughs> and disagree with, but, you know, all subprime lending wasn't necessarily bad at the time. Uh, it was the predatory nature of it that got really bad. If, if 
thinking of creative ways to get people in homes that otherwise wouldn't have gotten to a home in and of itself wasn't a horrible thing to do. And we saw some improvements with regards to black, white inequality and home ownership differences initially. But that said, um, we also should keep in mind, I think Ashley said it, if not, I know all the other, all the other panelists have said this, uh, the white community was literally offered uh, entitlements giveaways in, in the form of the Homestead Act, in the form of GI bills, uh, other types of products. So why do we need not come up with similar products today to facilitate black home ownership? Why, why do we even have to ground it in debt to begin with? Oh, uh, Louise, I thought you wanted to. No, that was. I I could. Um, Go ahead. Uh, yeah, please. Um, I I think I I would um, bring us back to what Ashley keeps pointing out correctly about the um, PPP that that or that that the um, the the coronavirus um, payouts in general going through banks that we've kind of accepted that like government policy is is like increasingly enmeshed with this financial world or that that's necessary or taken for granted. I've been looking at um, like municipal bond products, again, related to my work in Michigan, um, as far as water goes and, and how, how closely knit these um, bond underwriters are with these municipal bond projects such that they start to feel like they're creating the infrastructure in order to have something to invest in. Um, and so I, I would focus less less on, uh, and again, thinking about what Derek was saying about what increases agency. I think we should reframe about what our focus is, is like, and um, think about goals about what will increase people's agency and who is involved, who's who's who who gets their paws on the money while it while it flows through Mersa's system. So, um, and who's and who's involved in in um, setting what we think of as taken for granted as, as of course banks need to touch this money as it goes to um, business owners. So um, it, I think that until we like start to be able to see that financial system more closely and understand how and why um, uh, these banks and other financial actors are involved in what we you know, might imagine as like a government person process um, that we can't really know what the outcome of a given um, policy change will be like, like reshaping how mortgages look or, or creating more opportunities. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it even extends beyond home, home ownership. We know with small business administration, uh, when we had minority loans back, back when it was originally created, they were direct lending from the federal government. It wasn't through a bank. And Mercer's work speaks a great deal on this with, with regards to the lack of black banks that we have in existence. It, it would be naive of us to think that a relationship with a bank uh, that's related to one's ethnicity is uh, unrelated to this process of lending. Um, why is it that we have to have banks as intermediaries? I, I guess that point has already been raised when you know, we can have direct lending, even with regards to student loans. There was a point when uh, universities, as well as people, were more directly subsidized as it related to tuition finance than it is today. You, why do we have to have a system of uh, debt finance to go to college through bank through our private banking sector? Um. So. Uh um, maybe this is a little bit um, tangential or at least perpendicular. <laughs> um, um, last night, uh, I watched with my kids the, so the social dilemma, the one about um, the addictiveness of social media and like Instagram and all these apps. And, and the thing that, you know, one of the commenters said is, you know, what these companies, these companies don't care about what you want. They, they have a purpose, right? And their purpose is just you know, visual. It's like not a smart system. It's just an algorithm created for one purpose only. The, the, the more time you spend there, the better for them. And that's their driving purpose. And I think if you stick debt, money, banking, 
capital into that framework. And, you know, I, I, I sort of put this in the, in the intro, but I, w- I wish I had said it better, but, you know, capital also has a driving motive, right? So, and the driving motive of capital is just to make more capital. So um, debt and money, money just wants to expand itself and it will use the things in its, in its way to, to do it. And, and what, what has the system that we have set up is that it will use black communities, it has for hundreds of years, you know, slavery, then sharecropping and, uh, you know, J- Jim Crow, like it, it, it consumes um, that, ra- it uses that racial hierarchy on which, you know, Americans have easily kind of uh, built their society um, to perpetuate itself. And so I think um, seeing things, excuse me, seeing things from debt or capital's perspective um, just, you know, allows that, you um, uh, kind of what do, what does it want and how do we uh, protect ourselves from the needs of of capital and 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 taking out this like moral um so I, I mean a couple of us you know uh, Derek just said like it's not subprime credit is fine if you want subprime credit like if you if you want to open a bit up a business and you're like a willing person that's it's fine to say I'll pay you extra money so that you can, you know, take this risk. And I know that this idea is a good thing, whatever. Um, that's not the system that we have. Um, the system that we have is, is, is hard. It's like a hegemonic debt system. And so I think, um, I don't know, uh, uh, it would be useful to, uh, um, see it holistically again. I agree. When we think about the fact that financial institutions are making record profits, um, even now, even post-recession, um, post the Great Recession, um, and think about the fact that, but uh, wealth and income inequality is growing, um, and thinking about who we are willing to sacrifice um, on the altar of money, making more money, and too often it's people of color and poor people. They are the ones who it's okay for them to pay more for everything. It's okay. It's okay for them to pay more for credit. It's okay to sip in trillions of dollars from these communities that these communities don't have and can't afford to lose because the as long as the banks are doing well and we're posting record profits, the stock market looks good. We're okay with this growing inequality and we're okay with it because of who is most impacted, what the face of that inequality looks like. And we have to reckon with that. We have to reckon with a society that is okay with certain people being poor and staying poor and a government that allows that to continue to happen. Um, I, I, so much of this is entrenched, but that doesn't mean there are not steps that can be taken to address this. And there are direct steps that can be taken to alleviate some of these inequities and help people build wealth and move into the financial mainstream. I think, um, you know, subprime and predatory lending don't have to be synonymous, right? But too often they are. Too often innovation is used to to talk about access to credit, which then becomes predatory lending, and it's called innovation. We're trying to... There are ways you can open up pathways without enabling predatory lending. Plenty of responsible borrowers, plenty of folks who would do well with access to credit, but the affordable credit, but they are denied it by the financial mi- mainstream because we created a, not just this system, but a credit scoring system that's based on models that have um, ha- that have been biased from the start, right? So if we have an entire financial system and credit system based on credit scores, when the credit scoring system itself is based on a history of discrimination and racial oppression, then we have problems at every single juncture of the system. And so we can we need to have solutions at every single juncture of the system. And it's too easy to say um, we just need innovation or we or that this is OK. No, again, we created this system and we can uncreate it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, unless you got a question, I'll jump in. I, I, I don't begrudge the profit motive. I begrudge the state complicity with the profit motive. I begrudge the state complicity, especially with the use of race with regards to the profit motive. That's really pernicious. Uh, The state has a fiduciary responsibility to its people, not shareholders of corporations. So a lot of this is about power and the role that the state has played 
historically tilting the scale in favor of corporations and tilting the scale in favor of one group of people as opposed to the other. Let me, it has come up in, in, in all your excellent contributions. Um, Mercer called it hegemonic financial system. Ashley mentioned, I mean, if I summarized or talked about how um, in an e unequal system, the, the financial system might actually, at every juncture along the way, as she put it, uh, reinforce these inequalities. So can I take away, um, and I'll come back to a question from the audience in a second, but can I take away from this that your view would be uh, the sort of the, the force of the financial sector to uh, address um, or the, at least in the current setup to address and help mitigate racial inequalities against the background of these pre-existing large discrepancies. Um, you would, all of you would sort of think uh, finance in itself is not going to be a powerful source to address these inequalities, at least as the system is set up now. I mean, Mercer said it, finance does what it does best. It, it accumulates and consolidates and iterates and grows and grows and grows. There's a role of the public sector to address uh, that, that, that process and, and act as a counterbalance of the disproportionate power that finance would have without a state intervention. I'd agree with that, but I'd also say that that doesn't absolve financial institutions of their role either. Um, you know, right now we're in a we're in a reckoning with racial injustice in this country, um, and we have all of these companies, including banks, coming out and saying, you know, we support Black Lives Matter. There are direct things that banks, financial institutions, can do to actually show that they support Black Lives Matter. They can go back to the communities that they have deserted. Right? There are so many Black and Brown communities that don't have banks, where payday lenders have therefore set up shop and there are no banks, it's a banking desert. Um, they can deal with the fact that, that with their own history of lending discrimination, they can make actual targeted efforts to better serve uh, Black communities, to make sure that they are lending responsible credit, financing mortgages, financing businesses, doing all of those pieces. So they do have a role to play. Yes, there's a huge role for the federal government, but there are, but there are a lot of companies, a lot of banks who are saying that they support Black lives. I want them to put their money where their mouth is. Um, I have a lot of thoughts, but I'll, I'll just say if that's okay. Um, I should really write these down. Um, where we the, the overall system that we're describing is one in which difference is profitable. And that doesn't necessarily mean that a given bank looks at its balance sheet and says, should I discriminate or not? What's what's better for my balance sheet? But that upholding the overall, overall racial hierarchy is profitable because it fits in their system that they have set up. And it's much easier to keep in the system's path than to diverge. And other people will keep them and start to leave that path. And so... Um, when we think about like innovation, they will innovate in that same path, which right now involves predation. And um, as long as you see a community as a group to exploit, your innovations will involve a new way to exploit them that you might cover up with some pretty new awning and a Black Lives Matter sticker in 2020. Um, and and that's why I've been talking a lot about predatory inclusion to, to talk about it instead like, like Given the agency um, to to make these decisions and how we, um, you know, we are kind of like out in a world that has been very eff effectively deregulated in a lot of ways, and then we're left saying, well, how can we, you know, entice financial actors to believe that it's in their best interest, to, you know, for a branding strategy, like, um, you know, that that's like that's all we have left, and I think we need more. Um, power to push um, financial actors to do what Ashley's talking about, because I don't think they're going to do it from the goodness of their heart, or if they do, I will worry about their ulterior motive down the line. 
Um, I as don't think so either, but... To... Oh. No, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to add. I, I agree. I don't think we're going to see them, but I do think we are seeing some of it shift, right? So um, McKinsey and Company put out a report earlier this summer, maybe it was last summer, talking about how much um, racial wealth inequality actually drained from the economy, how much is taken from the GDP. Um, as the uh, you know, majority, the future of the home buying market is going to be majority people of color. So if you are saying that there is a huge hindrance in the form of student debt, for instance, that's stopping people of color from buying homes, that affects everybody. So I think we're going to see more and more of, of what, um, you know, Derek Bell called interest convergence theory, where everyone's interests are going to become aligned. And it's actually, there is um, not just a moral imperative, but a profit imperative for lending institutions to do more on some of these issues. And I think folks, some folks are beginning to realize that um, um, it's that it's not just the right thing to do, but it actually can help their bottom line. See, see for me, and this might be the first point of pushback on our panel, right, when we get towards the end. Uh, I, I think that becomes a context-specific argument that maybe in certain contexts that may be true, but we've seen throughout history that exploitation and extrapolation has been profitable. So that, that's my concern when we start making the, the interest convergence arguments that it's not universal and it becomes very specific and it leaves us vulnerable to another period where it's not interest convergence. That I, I, I think the moral economy is enough reason and the government should be compelled to ensure that type of economy period. Oh, I don't. Oh, I don't disagree, Derek. I'm. I'm with you. I think the biggest role is for the federal government to create these situations. Um, I. I just think there's a little bit of it that that I hope some companies are beginning to realize. But I do think, um, yeah, they're not going to do it on their own, and we'll just keep recycling the same pieces. I. I don't disagree with you at all. As we're coming to the end, I have one last but very, very big question that you have to, that I'll ask you to uh, answer very quickly, and it has come up in the Q&A as well. Uh, what role would a debt jubilee play as a policy option, possibly uh, under in, in, in the future, under, under new uh, governments, um, and how can that be linked to the racial equality agenda? Do you have... Maybe each of you, we don't have much time, but a quick idea, like what is the policy that you would um, favor most in that regard? Um, shall we start with the, maybe the inverse of the introduction? So start with Ashley and then um, uh, um, Derek, Luis, and end with Mersa. Um, so definitely think we have to do something um, about debt in this country, particularly student debt. Um, we did a report last year where we found that even if you canceled $10,000 per borrower, $20,000 per borrower, you would have a profound impact on those who are struggling the most. Um, the, mo the vast majority of people who are in default on student debt were one, they were low income students, they were Pell eligible students, and they're on default for small amounts of money. I think there are a lot of misconceptions about the student debt crisis. Um, that when you actually look at the numbers and think about debt cancellation broadly, you could have a profound impact even without full cancellation. And that's the argument that we continue to make. Um, but, I, but yes, absolutely, we have to do something about debt in this country. Um, and that's just one example. Yeah, so, so gratitude for the invitation and I'm glad INET is doing this and disseminate inform this information and also gratitude to my co-panelists and I, I would share stage with any of you anytime and, and thank you for all the work y'all do. Uh, debt Jubilee to me is the right way to go. Uh, it is restorative. It is uh, economically and racially just. Uh, and uh, especially in the domains of student debt and medical debt, a lot of it has been accrued in an immoral way. And uh, mm -hmm. to wipe the slates clean is the right way to go. And then to accompany with it with a new system that provides economic rights so that people, when they are sick, do not have to accrue immoral debt so that they, they can uh, live and, and have a, a, good, a good, reasonable lifestyle, or to learn and get a college degree. In the 21st century, we can afford to provide everybody with a quality education 
from kindergarten all the way through college, and we should have a public option for that. So, you know, finally, the thing I'd say is we need an economic rights frame away from a neoliberal frame, which tries to facilitate capital and the finance sector with government subsidy to, to extract and exploit uh, from, from, from those that are most vulnerable. Um, here, here, uh, same. I've, I've been focusing on student debt, debt forgiveness myself the most. And, um, and it went from 2018 to a thing I said in the throwaway, like snarky comment when people said, what should we do to last year getting to work on an actual debt forgiveness policy. So the needle can really shift quickly. And I think us continuing to push for large, uh, debt forgiveness and the smaller, uh, debt forgiveness packages in the coronavirus uh, response op packages is is important and um, and could could actually you know given how much things have changed in a year I think we can actually see this happen soon. Marissa, um, you know. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think uh, a debt jubilee, you know, in the old in ancient tradition, the jet, debt jubilee was to sort of relieve societal pressure. It wasn't about the, the debt. It was about um, lowering tensions uh, between sort of, you know, uh, the the poles and I think, um, or the, the, the inequality. So so I think there there has to be something. I mean, we're at a boiling point and, and just crazy inequalities that are having all sorts of effects. They're just infecting our uh, democracy, our health, our um, livelihoods. And so, so, I mean, I think a dead Jubilee plus all of the other things that we've mentioned are not just like a good idea. At some point, they're going to be a necessity. Um, and maybe maybe we're beyond what's possible, but I do think we're at a state of, of real emergency. And so, yes, yes, and. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much in the name of INET and the Private Debt Initiative to our four uh, panelists. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to the audience. Um, I personally learned so much and I'm uh, looking forward to the next installments also of the uh, debt talks that are coming forward. But that next one is going to be in, in, in October and uh, we'll talk about uh, credit risk um, in the economy uh, nationally and um, in the US and internationally. Um, but before we um, get there, there are more INET events coming up and you're all uh, very warmly invited to those events as well. So this Friday at noon Eastern time, there's a research webinar and a book launch on macroeconomic inequality from Reagan to Trump. And next Tuesday, again at noon Eastern time, uh, a seminar or webinar on the future of work, what's at stake. So uh, that's it from me. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have taken up a little bit more of t more time than we wanted to, but not so much, and it was definitely worth it. Thank you so much, everyone, and um, hope to see you all soon again on the Dead Talks, Annette. Thank you. <laughs>